I'm going to tell you the true story of how mammals got our placentas. The placenta is the organ that allows babies to grow inside the mother. So it's what gives us live birth instead of, you know, laying eggs. And one very important feature of being human is our long pregnancies because they allow our big brains time to safely develop inside the mother before we're pushed out into the world. But this is not just a story about mammals like humans. It's also a story about microbes. You probably think of yourself as a human, but you're actually a human microbe hybrid. One way you're a hybrid is due to your microbiome, which gets a lot of press these days. Maybe you've already heard that you carry 10 times as many bacterial cells as human cells in and on your body. These microbes carry out essential functions for you. They produce essential vitamins. They help you digest your food. They train your immune system. They even wield influence on your mood and your behavior by messing with your hormones and your neurotransmitters. But there's another much deeper way that you are a human microbe hybrid. One that doesn't get a lot of press, maybe because it's a bit uncomfortable to think about. Your DNA, your genome is part human and part virus. And some of this viral DNA gives you key features that are at the core of who you are. You see, there's this class of viruses called retroviruses that genetically modify their victims. There are a number of domesticated retroviruses living in your human genome. But I'm going to introduce you to just one, the one that gave the mammal its placenta. First things first, to explain how viruses gave the mammal its placenta, we have to answer the question, what is a virus anyway? Viruses are little more than rogue genetic material. They're rogue because it's genetic material that's not under the influence of any living organism. Viruses are acellular, so they're not able to carry with them a complete toolkit for life. Remember that all living things are made of cells, and a cell is enclosed by a membrane, and inside that membrane, it carries all the tools it needs to carry out life-giving functions like harvesting and using energy from the environment, growth, reproduction, things like that. Viruses, being very small and non-cellular, don't have any space to carry equipment for things like metabolism or replication. Viruses infect cells so that they can use the cell's equipment for performing these tasks. So they only have lifelike qualities once they have infected a cell. Because of this, they do not quite make the cut for the title alive, but they do control their own transfer from victim to victim, and they do exhibit a number of lifelike qualities once they're inside their victim. So they certainly occupy a gray area between the living and non-living worlds. We're all familiar with the computer virus, which is a bit of computer code which hijacks the function of a victim's computer. These were called viruses for a reason, because this is exactly what real viruses do. A virus injects genetic code into a host, and that genetic code hijacks the cell's function. The cell is now under the control of the virus and its main purpose in life becomes to replicate the virus. So at the core of the virus is its genetic material. Viruses can use DNA as genetic material like cells do, or they can come with an RNA genome. RNA is a very similar molecule to DNA. The viral genome carries all the instructions necessary for building new viruses. So when the virus inserts its DNA or RNA into its victim, that's what the victim does. It uses the viral genetic instructions to build new viruses on behalf of the virus. Viral genetic material travels in a protective protein case called the capsid, which safely transports the viral genetic code from one victim to another. Viral capsids are crystals. Crystals are made when identical molecules or elements come together in these repetitive patterns. The small protein pieces of the capsid are all identical to each other, and they adhere to each other naturally due to their chemistry coming together around the genetic material in repetitive patterns. There are a few different capsid shapes, all of which are crystals. Now, we're emerging from the COVID pandemic as I make this video, which of course negatively affected the lives of children everywhere. But my five-year-old girl loves crystals, and when she heard that viruses are crystals, love grew inside of her for these pretty little microscopic pathogens. Now, some viruses are enveloped by a fatty lipid envelope, and you can see an example of an enveloped virus on the left and a non-enveloped or a naked virus on the right. This lipid envelope is identical to the cell's membrane because this virus actually stole it from the cell that birthed it. On its way out of the cell, it cloaked itself in some of the cell's lipid membrane. 
So enveloped viruses have rogue genetic material inside a crystal protein capsid, inside a stolen lipid envelope, while non-enveloped viruses have only the rogue genetic material inside the crystal capsid. Viruses have to attach to their victim before they can infect. Without attachment proteins, a virus is completely harmless. In naked viruses, the attachment proteins, sometimes called spikes, which you may have heard about in the news, they're attached directly to the capsid. And on enveloped viruses, they're embedded in the lipid envelope. Now, when a naked virus attaches to structures on the surface of the cell, it stimulates the cell to bring it in as if it were food inside a bubble called a food vacuole. So this gray line here, that's the cell's membrane. Now, when an enveloped virus attaches to structures on the surface of the cell, the viral envelope will fuse with the cell membrane and the capsid will empty into the cell. Attachment proteins on enveloped viruses are sometimes called fusion proteins because they help the lipid envelope fuse with the cell membrane. Now the shape of the viral attachment proteins determines what kinds of cells a virus can infect or not infect. Viral attachment proteins must bind perfectly to a molecule on the host cell's surface. A virus can only infect cells that carry a molecule that matches with the viral attachment protein. So at the top in red, you have the protein crystal capsid. Uh, this is an enveloped virus. So you could imagine this being, you know, SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 or influenza that causes the flu or HIV. Any of those are enveloped viruses. And then at the bottom, you have the cell membrane. And you can see that the lipid envelope looks just like the cell membrane. Remember, enveloped viruses fuse with the host cell's membrane only if the viral attachment proteins match to some molecule on the cell's surface. So in the panel on the left, we have a good fit between the virus's spike proteins in red and a surface molecule on the cell in blue. In the panel on the right, the fit isn't good. The spike protein cannot successfully bind because the shape isn't quite right. So we will have no fusion here and no infection. If this molecule that the virus binds to is found on cells of only one species, the virus can infect only that species. If the molecule it binds to is found across many species, the virus will be a generalist. If the molecule it binds to is found only on cells of one type of tissue, then the virus will be restricted to infecting only that tissue type. HIV only infects immune cells because only immune cells carry a surface molecule that matches its spike protein. SARS-CoV-2 binds to a surface molecule called ACE2, which is found on several tissue types, so it, it can infect a number of different tissue types. All right, now let's talk about retroviruses, which are probably the most interesting class of viruses. And it includes very dangerous viruses like HIV. So all retroviruses are enveloped and they are all RNA viruses to start, but once inside the cell, they reverse transcribe their RNA to DNA. Now remember that DNA is a blueprint for protein. So when we express our genes in our DNA, we're building protein from the instructions in those genes. A cell will open up a gene from the DNA library that it needs to express in that particular moment. And it'll make an RNA photocopy or transcript from the gene. And this photocopy travels to the protein construction site. So the DNA library is humongous. It has all the genes for the entire organism. We don't take whole libraries to construction sites, do we? No, we take copies of the relevant building plans. And that's what RNA is. It's a copy of the relevant building plans. So the typical flow of gene expression is DNA to RNA to protein. Now, retro in the word retrovirus refers to going backwards. So retroviruses arrive in a cell with RNA and transcribe it backwards to DNA. Then the viral DNA travels to the host's nucleus and inserts itself into the host's chromosome. Once there, it's called a provirus. This means that retroviruses genetically modify their host. Now there's a set of tools the retrovirus needs to allow it to perform this genetic modification. All retroviruses carry the instructions to build these tools in their DNA, and that allows us to find them and identify them, even when they're just sitting quietly, hidden inside our massive human genome. So here is the retroviral life cycle. Step one is always attachment. There's binding between the virus's fusion proteins and structures on the cell surface. Step two is entry. Retroviruses are enveloped viruses, meaning that once attached, their lipid envelope fuses with the cell membrane, emptying the viral capsid and genome into the cell. 
the cell has now been infected. Step three is uncoding, meaning the virus sheds its protein capsid and releases naked viral RNA into the cell. Step four is biosynthesis, which means synthesis of viral parts. The first part of biosynthesis is reverse transcription of RNA to DNA and then insertion of viral DNA into the host's DNA, resulting in a provirus. Now, the whole cycle might pause here and the virus may simply lie latent in the host's chromosome. The cell's daughters will inherit the provirus just as they inherit every other gene in the parent cell's genome. The provirus is now a permanent part of this cell's lineage. All future descendants will inherit it. Or the virus may have its host cell express its genes. This would be the second part of step four biosynthesis. The cell expresses viral DNA as viral proteins, just as it would express any of its own genes as proteins. Viral RNA and proteins are now beginning to build up in the cell. The viral fusion proteins are going to go to the cell's membrane to wait for the virus to pick them up later. Step five is maturation. The viral capsid proteins crystallize around the viral RNA, forming many new retroviruses. Step six is release. The matured capsids bump against the underside of the cell's membrane, stimulating budding. The capsids bud from the cell in a stolen lipid envelope, complete with their own fusion proteins for infecting the next cell. So proviruses have a latent phase and an expressed phase. In their latent phase, the provirus passively replicates just when the cell divides, and it's inherited by all descendants of the infected cell. Now, sometimes latent proviruses carry genes that cause the host cell to proliferate more rapidly, resulting in more copies of the cell and also more copies of the provirus that the cells contain. The consequence of this can be cancer. A tumor is what you get when your cells just keep dividing and keep proliferating when they shouldn't. A number of retroviruses have been linked to cancer. And then there's the expressed phase. So in the expressed phase, proviral genes are expressed by the host, producing new viruses that are released to infect new cells. Retroviruses can be very damaging. An example of a famous modern retroviral disease is HIV. You can never get rid of this virus once you have it because it becomes part of your DNA. We call viruses like HIV exogenous retroviruses because they came from outside of us. We were infected from some outside source. Exo refers to outside. But retroviruses have been around infecting our ancestors for a very long time, and they've accumulated in our genomes over the eons. At least 8% of our genome is composed of ancient retroviruses most of which are now silenced and defunct, but which we can still identify by their characteristic genetic sequences that are typical of all retroviruses. These viruses are called endogenous retroviruses. Endo refers to within, because they are now part of our genome. They come from our own ancestors, not some outside source. But some endogenous retroviruses are not defunct. Some of them have provided us with novel genes that make us different from other animals. Domesticated is the term we use for these retroviruses whose genes we actively use. I use this image because look at the shadow there, the shadow of the dog's past as a dangerous wolf. Our domesticated retroviruses may have had a very dangerous past, but we've, well, we've captured them and made them our own. Which brings me to the evolution connection. One incredibly interesting example of a domesticated retrovirus is the one that gave us mammals our placenta. Now, mammals are characterized by growing hair for warmth, producing milk from mammary glands, we mammals are named for our mammary glands, and giving live birth. Instead of our eggs maturing outside the mother, mammalian eggs generally mature inside the mother. Our fetuses are nourished by a placenta instead of by the egg yolk and egg white. The placenta is interesting because it's an organ that's built out of both maternal and fetal tissues, which allows the mother to nourish the baby and remove its wastes. It forms when fetal tissue invades the mother's uterus so that it can absorb the mother's oxygen and the mother's food. So these structures right here, these are called the chorionic villi, and they form the boundary or the interface between maternal and fetal tissue, but they're made by the developing fetus. They proliferate rapidly. I mean, look at them here. Invading the mother's uterine lining, 
bursting her blood vessels left and right so that her blood washes over these fetal structures, transferring all their nutrients and oxygen to the baby. This is totally parasitic behavior. Now, typically our immune systems would not tolerate something like this, but the fetal portion of the placenta also dampens the mother's immune response. All these behaviors of the fetal placenta are quite virus-like. But one of the most virus-like features of the mammalian placenta is fusion between cells. Remember this image which describes how enveloped viruses enter cells? Viral fusion proteins, in orange, allow fusion between the viral lipid envelope and the me membrane of the cells that they infect. So this layer of cells in blue, these are on the fetal side of the placenta, so they're made by the baby, but they form the boundary between the fetal and the maternal tissues. They all fuse together, becoming like a single large continuous cell because they express a retroviral fusion protein known as syncytin. How do we know it's a retroviral protein? Because it's found smack in the middle of stereotypical retroviral code. Placental syncytin is a viral fusion protein that's expressed by animal cells. And this fusion is absolutely essential to placental function because we have immune cells that can squeeze between other cells, allowing them to travel through body tissue to reach sites of infection. But we wouldn't want the mother's immune cells to squeeze across the placental barrier and eat up the parasitic fetus. But luckily, we don't have any between cells here because what we have effectively is one single continuous cell, no seams, so that the mother's white blood cells can't get across. This protects the fetus from attack by the mother's immune system. And actually, though syncytin comes from an important domesticated retrovirus, it's not even the only one. The placenta's genetic code is rife with domesticated retroviruses, which dampen the mother's immune response, cause rapid proliferation of the fetus's cells, and help with invasion of maternal tissues. So mammalian fetuses infect their mothers much like a virus because they actively express retroviral genes. So what if we genetically modify laboratory animals so that they're not able to express these retroviruses? They lose their pregnancies. The placentas don't attach properly to the uterine lining of the mother. They don't invade maternal tissues, so they fail to supply nutrition to the fetus, and the fetus ends up being attacked by the mother's immune system. Now, not all mammals give live birth. Platypuses are mammals because they have hair and they produce milk, but they are remnants of an ancient mammalian group that predated live birth, who still laid eggs like their reptilian ancestors. Platypuses belong to a group of mammals called monotremes. While monotremes were once more common, only five species have survived the ages and are still around today. The genetic code for platypus fetal and uterine tissues does not contain retroviruses like ours does, supporting the notion that retroviruses are required to form the placenta. So how did we get our placenta? Once upon a time, the primitive placenta of one of our monotreme ancestors was genetically modified by a retrovirus. Retroviral genes caused fetal tissue to invade the mother and block her immune response to the invasion. It is these domesticated retroviruses that allow our babies to gestate for long periods of time inside the womb, a hallmark feature of mammals and particularly humans. But placentas can occasionally be found in non-mammals like fish and reptiles. Are retroviruses responsible for placentas in non-mammals too? The Mabuya lizard is a skink with a very mammal-like placenta. And its genome has been compared to other skinks that lay eggs, like normal lizards. And we do indeed find retroviral DNA that controls critical aspects of its placenta formation. Its retroviruses are different from ours, but they function in the same way, using viral fusion proteins to invade maternal tissue and create a barrier against her immune system, and also immune suppression proteins that disarm the mother's immune system. A group of spiny rayed fish, known as percomorphs, are known for their tendency to give birth to live young. This group of fish all share an ancient retroviral fusion protein that's fossilized in their DNA. Given the age of this group of fish, this is the oldest domesticated retrovirus that we have found in vertebrates. Vertebrates are animals with a backbone. And here, it's responsible for fish placentas. Placentation, plac 
placentation, placentation, or the development of a placenta has evolved separately many times in the animal kingdom. And in each place we've looked, we found retroviruses that are responsible. There's still many other placentas that we haven't checked for retroviruses yet. For example, many sharks also give live birth, as well as a number of snakes, such as anacondas and vipers. But given the emerging pattern, if I had to place a bet, I bet retroviruses are responsible for these placentas too. So if retroviral infection can evolve placentas in so many animals, can they also evolve other animal features? I mean, do retroviruses only make placentas or do they have any other talents? Well, this research is still really cutting edge, so we have a lot still to learn. But right now, it appears that the placenta is not the only tissue that retroviruses have helped to develop. For example, there is really compelling evidence that retroviruses evolved the brains of us land vertebrates, increasing the efficiency of information transfer between neurons and enhancing our brain plasticity. Plasticity is another word for adaptability. This means that retroviruses have made our brains more efficient and more adaptable. And they also seem to help protect our brains against the toxic effects of other retroviruses like HIV. If you're interested, you can check out some of the research on ARC and HERVK, a couple of interesting retroviruses that have been found in the brain. It may not just be in the brain that our domestic retroviruses protect us from other retroviruses. In human cells grown in Petri dishes, Researchers have watched human domesticated retroviruses produce a variety of products that interfere with HIV, preventing HIV from infecting human cells and from replicating. Time will tell if our retroviruses work to fight HIV in our bodies as well as in the Petri dish. We also know that certain hormone glands express a lot of products from domesticated retroviruses. But right now, we don't really know what they do for us. So a number of tissue types appear to actively use their symbiotic retroviruses day to day. Still, researchers do wonder why the placenta seems to be the main target for retroviral invasion, especially the placentas of higher mammals, which are shaped by a cornucopia of retroviruses, far more than any other tissue type. Remember, scientists are just beginning to unveil the story of domesticated retroviruses. What I'm about to explain is not yet canonical. Scientists themselves are amazed at how often retroviruses invade fetal tissue and produce placentas. And once a species has a placenta, scientists are amazed at how often new retroviruses get added to the mix. The placenta seems to be a site of rapid retroviral innovation, where these viruses throw all their proverbial spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. And we don't really know why yet, but here is the current prevailing hypothesis. In reptile, bird, and monotreme mammal eggs, the chorion is the outermost layer of fetal tissue. It's represented right here. That's the outermost layer of fetal tissue. And it provides protection to the growing baby. It's involved in providing the embryo with nutrients and oxygen and removing wastes. The chorion of the placenta is also the outermost layer of fetal tissue. Right here, this, this layer right here. This is the layer that invades the mother's uterus to form the placenta and fuses to create a barrier against her immune system. Now, when I say that the chorion is fetal tissue, I mean that the cells it's built from are made by the developing baby. And so they have all the same DNA as the baby has. You see, after sperm fertilizes egg, the fertilized egg grows and divides and grows and divides, producing a ball of cells. As the cells in this ball grow in number, they begin to become different cell types. So here you can see very soon after the egg has been fertilized, some of the fetal cells have already separated. The group of cells in green in the middle here will eventually become the embryo, which will grow into the baby. And the cells on the outside in purple will become the chorion, but they will all come from the same original fertilized egg. Whether hatching from an egg or birth from the womb, the chorion is thrown away after birth. The chick will leave it behind with a broken egg and the placenta is birthed after the baby and it's either eaten by the mother or thrown in the garbage or left to rot somewhere in the natural landscape. No one wants to see a leftover placenta, so I'm not gonna show it. Now, in most cells of the body, retroviral DNA is silenced. How? By adding little molecules to the viral DNA that turns it off. Why? Well. 
Retroviruses introduce change, and change can be dangerous. Retroviruses disrupt genes that were functioning perfectly well. They change how our DNA is expressed. They wreak havoc on the law and order of our bodies. So we turn them off. But it appears this retrovirus silencing does not happen in the chorion, which means that any functional retroviruses in the DNA get expressed in the chorion, allowing the chorion to express any retroviral fusion and immune suppression proteins it might have. This has resulted in the chorion producing placentas on repeated occasions by invading maternal tissue to some extent or another, fusing and blocking her immune response. Oh look, here's a picture of a leftover placenta being buried in the dirt after all. The reason the fetus can afford to not turn off retroviruses in the chorion is probably because the chorion just gets thrown out after birth anyway. Most of the problems that could be caused by retroviruses won't affect the baby because ultimately the chorion separates from the baby. So embryos and fetuses allow those retroviruses to speak in the chorion, which means the chorion benefits from all that retroviral innovation while experiencing minimal risk since it is disposable. The placenta is the most diverse tissue across the animal kingdom because different animal groups have been invaded by different sets of retroviruses. Each time a retrovirus invades, it donates its unique fusion proteins, immune suppression proteins, proliferation genes, and who knows what else. The reason placentas are so diverse is that they are rapidly evolving, changing every time a new retrovirus inserts itself into some species' genetic instructions for the chorion. Retroviruses probably don't target the chorion more than they target other tissues. It's more likely that the chorion just doesn't silence its retroviruses the way other tissues do. So all the bizarre retroviral activity is on display there. So retroviruses have given you important defining features as a mammal, but also as a human. Extended gestation allows humans the time we need to develop our huge, powerful brains in the safety of our mother's womb. Placentas are necessary for extended gestation. Without placentas, we humans would not have evolved. And without retroviruses, there would be no placentas. So retroviruses are more than just part of our human microbiome. They are part of our human genome. We are quite literally animal-virus hybrids.